So now we've talked about the differences, let's start talking about how we can model um, a flow that's going over a hypersymmetric harness bottom. Um, so the first way is we're going to go back to Newtonian theory. Newtonian theory. Now at this point you've probably completely forgotten what Newtonian theory is. But the idea was this. A long time ago, Newton, the guy who invented the fig Newton, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, you know what I'm talking about. He had this idea for how lift and drag worked. He thought, well, the air hits the surface of the body, and once it hits the surface of the body, it turns and it goes, you know, upward. So we have all these lines going there, it hits the body, and then as soon as it hits the body, it moves in the same direction as it. So that was his idea. The issue is, it's completely wrong. Like, that's not how it actually works. And for subsonic speeds, this is horrible. It doesn't work at all. So as in real life, well before I get to the body, the air flows over it. It sm changes smoothly. So that was Newtonian theory right there, and this is reality. Right here. Okay, so why are we bringing it up again? Well, the answer is that when we get to hypersonics, it's actually a reasonable approximation. So this right here was for subsonic. And as a note, even supersonics would not be good. But if we look at hypersonics, we're going to see that it's very different. So I'm going to draw my little hypersonic half wedge here. And in this case, I have a shock wave. And that shock wave is very, very close to my surface. You could even say that my shock wave approximates my surface. It's not perfect, but it is close. So I'll just go ahead and say that the shock wave approximates the surface. And so what I get is that I have a flow that's coming in straight. And then when it reaches the surface, on quotes, it will suddenly turn. And it goes, you know, parallel to that surface. So here, Newtonian theory is actually okay. And it's a good place for us to jump off and start talking about how we can model these hypersonic flows without just simply saying, get some fancy CFD going. <laughs> because at some point, that will be the answer. I mean, like at some point, You'll just have to say, ah, okay, ANSYS, help me out here. Okay, help me out here. So, hmm. What we'll do is we'll first develop this for a flat plate. Okay. Why a flat plate? You know why we use a flat plate. We've done it like 15 billion times now. And I think it's just kind of hopefully getting, getting a good idea of what we're doing here. So here's my flat plate. I have some envelope here of air that's going to hit the flat plate. Because this flat plate is a hypersonic flat plate. Nice. I have some velocity that's incoming. I have an angle theta right there that's between the velocity and the surface. When it hits the surface, we're just assuming that the velocity goes down. And this will lead to some normal force over some area A. Beautiful. Okay. That looks pretty good to me. Hmm. So now let's figure out how we can get some forces out of this because in the end we're trying to look for the forces here if we can figure out the force then we can start figuring out the coefficients like coefficient of pressure and everything else so if we're gonna do that let's see here well we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration right but we're actually going to remember that that is approximation 
And so we're going to do it correctly, which is simply that force is equal to d dt of my mass times velocity. So it's the time rate of change of momentum, okay? Time rate of change of momentum. And in our case right here, we can simplify this a little bit, and this will simply be m dot times my velocity. And technically, it's the normal component of velocity. If you're wondering why that is, well, it's the whole like chain rule. So I would have m dot v plus v dot m. And if I'm not accelerating, acceleration equals zero, then that is also equal to zero. So that's why we only have this one component from that. Okay, so now that we have our basic equation here, we need to put that in terms of the detail. As a note, also we're gonna need to know what the density is, but we'll set a density for that. So mass flow rate has a pretty easy equation. Mass flow rate is gonna be equal to density times velocity times the area. But the velocity has to be normal to the area. Okay, we got velocity normal in two points now. We need to figure out what that velocity normal is. And that's not hard. After all, we already have this angle. And so that would be my normal velocity right there. And this one right here would be my tangential velocity. So if I take a right angle right there, I use some basic trig to realize that's also the angle theta. I have opposite over hypotenuse. So V normal is going to be equal to my velocity, whatever it is, times sine of theta. And so I can now plug all that in, and I have a fairly good approximation of that normal force. I think you put it right here. Yeah, that's good. So my normal force in this case, that's pushing on that plate, is going to be equal to density times velocity sine of theta times the area. I'm going to multiply that by the normal velocity, which is V sine of theta. Or if I want to simplify that a little bit, it's density V squared sine squared of theta times the area. Okay, so that's just the normal force. And now we want to put this, we want to normalize it per unit area, which is really, really easy to do. How? We just divide both sides by area. Happy days! I like it. So norm, oh goodness, what am I making a weird normal divided by area is equal to density v infinity squared sine squared theta. Okay, and hopefully this right here reminds you of something. If it doesn't, come on, it should remind you of something. And that thing is pressure. This is a pressure difference, effectively. So let's write it as a pressure difference, because that's what's causing this normal force in that component. If the pressure was the same on both sides, we would have no normal force. But we do, and so we have a pressure difference. And so what I'm going to say is, if I'm drawing my flat plate again, I have a pressure on one side being caused by the flow, and I simply have atmospheric pressure on the other side. And so any normal force right there, n over a, is going to be equal to p minus p infinity. So that's what I'm getting at here. So I rewrite that again. So p minus p infinity, so that's just simply my free stream pressure, is going to be equal to my density, v infinity squared times sine squared of theta. Okay, and now, because we like to get things normalized, we want to go from a pressure difference, finally, to a coefficient of pressure, okay? And so how do we do that? Well, we just need to remember that coefficient of pressure is equal to P minus P infinity over one-half rho infinity v infinity squared. And we have almost all of that here. So 
Using that definition, we can then take all of this, bring it down here, and say that my coefficient of pressure for Newtonian theory is simply equal to 2 sine squared of theta. Is it perfectly accurate? No. Is it reasonably accurate? Yes. Okay? Yes. Now, this was for a flat plate, okay? This was for a flat plate. And so I'm not going to go through a, a huge derivation here. I'm just going to go ahead and give you a, a basic idea of where, um, how we can then simplify this or use this for different shaped bodies. So let's just pick, pick a random shape here. You know what? That's a bit too random. I'll, I'll be honest with you. That's probably that's probably too much. I get you. I get you. No, no, no. We won't do that shape. Okay. Okay. There you go. So there we go. Oh, just a blunt body. So V infinity is coming in here. This point right here. That's the stagnation point. And it's also going to be where I have my max coefficient of pressure. Right there at that stagnation point. Okay, and I can have some surface S right here and distance S I'm moving. And if I pick a particular point I cared about and wanted to find out what the value was, I would need to know two things. I would need to know one, either what is this angle theta, or I would need to know what this angle phi is. So, what is the angle to the vertical, or what is the angle to the normal direction, or the tangential direction to that point? Either one works. It's fine either way. And then from Newtonian theory, I can get the following. So Newtonian theory is really simple. Nothing really changes too much for us. It's just like this guy's made up of a bunch of flat plates. That's all this, this is. So in Newtonian theory, I would have either the coefficient of pressure is equal to 2 sine squared theta, or it will be equal to 2 cosine squared of phi. But there's also something called modified Newtonian theory, which is more accurate. And so modified Newtonian theory is very similar, almost identical. We do make one caveat here. We say that my coefficient pressure is equal to, instead of 2, it's Cp max. So what is that max coefficient of pressure? And then we do sine squared of theta. And I can also do that in terms of cosine with Cp max, cosine squared of theta. There we go. There we go. Uh. And so from that, we have a good idea of what's going on here. And modified Newtonian actually does a fairly good job of um, following our real scenarios, following the real world results. So if you have to choose one, this would be the one to choose right there. Looks good. But the last thing I do need to mention is, well, wh what is CP max? How do I get it? So let's talk about that really quick and then we can go on from there. Okay, so for this body, you need to realize that I'm going to have a shock wave in front of it. Now it's going to be a bow shock wave, but if I'm looking like just in this very small region right there where I have CP max happening, I would see something that looks like the following. And so in this case, all I have here is a normal shock. So I have P infinity on one side, and from that normal shock, some Mach number right here, I will have P2. And so P2 is the one I'm going to use when I'm calculating my P infinity max, CP max. So for a normal shock, 
CP max is simply equal to T2 minus T infinity over everything else that is pre normal. Okay. And just as a note, this is equal to 2 only when my Mach number is actually equal to infinity. Otherwise, Mach number is less than infinity, CP max is always less than 2. So, this is what we have to modify it to get a more accurate result. Because otherwise, we're traveling at infinite Mach numbers, which is cool, but not very accurate. So that's it for Newtonian theory. Cool. We did it.